Okay, the purpose of this recording is to uh, discuss all the different topics associated with the loanable funds graph. Um, I probably say this way too often, but the first thing you need to do anytime you're dealing with a graph is you need to make sure you get the labeling down. For AP economics, macroeconomics, the label that you want to have here is real interest rate. Um, also, you can represent that with a lowercase r. And then on the bottom, since this is loanable funds, you want quantity of funds. Uh, sometimes you'll see it, quantity of L funds, quantity of loanable funds, but usually quantity of funds should get the job done. The loanable funds graph, pretty simply, is just a basic early on learned supply and demand graph. Supply going up and to the right, demand going down into the right. Um, the supply of loanable funds is a way to keep this in your head. You want to think of tends to come from savings, okay? And those savings can either be domestic savings, foreign savings. Um, they can also come from uh, if the Fed increases the money supply, that would cause the supply to shift to the right. If they decrease the money supply, it would cause the supply of loanable funds to shift to the left. It can also come from budget surpluses. If they have surpluses, it could, in theory, go to the right. Uh, in the real world, it seems as if most of the surpluses, for example, in the United States, when we had surpluses in the late 90s, it was used to pay down debt that we had run up previously. Um, so if we started running surpluses again, I imagine, in theory, we would use those surpluses to pay down some of our uh, debt that we've run up since that time. Okay, so you have supply there going up and to the right. When I say domestic savings, if you put $100 into the bank, you know this from the reserve ratio, the bank has to keep a certain amount in the bank, they can loan out the rest. So when they talk about domestic savings, it means when you are saving, when your neighbor's saving, when someone in Virginia is saving, someone in California is saving, all this money goes into the bank and can be loaned out. Uh, foreign savings is just what it sounds like, money that is being saved by foreign countries, so we'll use the example of China, they have a much higher savings rate than we do as Americans, um, 30 to 50 percent at times, they will save their disposable income. That savings then can be loaned to the United States. Okay, so there's, so it can be foreign or domestic savings, and as I said, the stuff about the Fed and the money supply, um, that could also shift the graph. The demand for loanable funds will tend to shift. Um, usually, it's, it's sort of an obvious situation when you see an increase in demand for loanable funds. They will say, like, the economy is doing better, people feel like borrowing more, people start consuming more. Well, if people are consuming more, they're consuming more of all things, so like sodas and hot dogs, but they're also consuming more expensive things that they tend to borrow to buy, like cars, college, uh, homes. And so they have to enter the market to look for loanable funds to acquire this money. Um, because not everybody has $50,000 in cash lying around to pay for college. So if you are, want to pay for it, you have to borrow the money and you enter the loanable funds market. Okay, so that shows up right here. And so that would be an increase in the real interest rate going from here to here, driving the real interest rate up. Okay, now a couple of other things about the loanable funds graph that's kind of important to understand. Um, <clears throat> I always ask you anytime we're doing any interest rate graph, so quantity of funds, supply, demand, get in the habit of putting the investment demand curve right next to it. Investment demand curve, quantity of investment. You're going to use your same interest rate. So since this is real, you're just going to port the real interest rate right over here. And let's say you have a scenario, as I said, the supply of this comes from savings. So you want to think of that as savings in your head. So they give you in a scenario that says the Americans start saving a higher percentage of their paycheck. So that's going to cause the real interest rate, as you can see, to come down to there. Now, what's the impact of that drop in the real interest rate is usually the next question. And that's really why you care about the change in interest rates, not just to know it, but what is that going to cause? So you have your investment demand curve here. And you can just dot that over. I'll use a different color. So you were here. Now the lower interest rate is here. And as you can see, there is more investment now 
in that is going to be made by private industry. Okay, remember investment is always private. And so once again, you have a greater amount of quantity investment demanded. Sorry about that. So now we got to wonder, well, what's the big deal about knowing that? Well, usually you will now go from this graph here. Okay, so we'll just take what we learned from this graph and we'll apply that to the aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph. So you have aggregate demand, short run aggregate supply. And if you remember, the aggregate demand is made up of C, I, G, net exports. So what you see here is you now have more I, and so that's going to translate into there. So if there's more I in aggregate demand, let's just quickly do our labeling here, then aggregate demand is going to shift to the right. You can see that there. And the reason aggregate demand shifting to the right, because Keteris Paribus, all things being equal, there's more I than there used to be because of the interest rate change. Okay, so you can sort of see that there. Um, on the other hand, what likes to, what they usually, they will, well, what they sometimes use this graph for, I guess I should say, is they want to maybe illustrate crowding out. So you have quantity of funds here. You have the supply of funds, the demand of funds. And you have your investment demand curve because you've been trained to do so. Anytime you draw an interest rate graph, you put this right next to it. And there's your investment demand. And even though the demand for loanable funds in many ways is the investment demand curve, we'll still kind of just keep these as separate thoughts, I guess. Um, and let's say they come up with a scenario and the government had a balanced budget, but now it increases its spending. And they'll usually say um, they're it will be implied in the question that it's no longer a balanced budget or they can't pay for it with tax dollars, so they have to borrow. So the government enters the loanable funds market and demands some of those funds. And you can see what happens here. The amount of investment in this economy actually goes from here, from point A to point B. And you can see on the horizontal axis that's less investment. And that investment, therefore, this private investment has been crowded out. That's what that expression means. They've been crowded out. And I think if we use real numbers, sometimes this makes a little more sense. Um, if this interest rate here is 5 and this interest rate here is 8, so we tie that over to here. This is 5 and this is 8. An interest rate of 5%, more companies were willing to, to take a loan and to invest. And just to give you a very simple scenario, very simplistic version here, but if a company thinks it can make 7% and it can borrow at 5%, it's probably going to do that because it can make 2% on that transaction in very simple terms. Now the government has come in and demanded some funds, and the result has been the interest rate has been driven up to 8%. Well, that same company that would have before done work at 7%, now their 7% isn't going to cover the cost of borrowing at 8%. So they're going to make 7%, but now they have to pay 8%. They're probably not going to do that. And because they've changed their mind and decided not to invest because of the increase in interest rates, it means they've been crowded out. So this shows you down here, this blue, is the amount of investment that's been crowded out. Now, once again, why is that a big deal when, some, when the real interest rate rises um, over here? is if you just think about it in terms of the aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph again, and these are all the connections you always want to make, there's going to be a change in I. In this case, it goes down. So while the government spending might have caused aggregate demand to go to the right, the lack of I is going to cause aggregate demand to go to the left um, in the long run eventually, or after the initial expansionary fiscal policy. So these, this group here was crowded out. So that's, anytime you hear crowding out, that's what you always want to think of. It's the government entering the market for these things and demanding some funds. Now, I did mention once in class that every now and then you'll see it written. So real, but instead of funds, it will say quantity of private funds. And so now we're just talking about the private sector. So if you think about supply and demand, if the government gets involved, it's not going to impact the demand because the government's public. It's not private. So they don't demand some of these funds. What they do, to use an analogy, is you know, the example before where the government demanded and it shifted demand to the right, you want to think of a bunch of 
let's say, pigs eating at a trough, and the government is the biggest pig. You know, our government currently right now is borrowing $1.2 trillion, roughly, to cover their expenses. So that's demanding a lot of loanable funds. So they can have a big impact on the demand of loanable funds. Now, since it's private, you want to think of the analogy, instead of all the pigs eating it from the same trough, it's almost like there's a conveyor belt going through one room and then going into the main room where most of the other pigs, Apple, GE, your local, you know, your Walmart, but then also like your local mom and pop stores all borrow from those funds. But in order to get to that trough that they want to borrow from, it must go through the other room where the government is and the government will consume some of those funds to borrow and what comes out at the end just means there is less supply of loanable funds available for them to borrow and what you'll notice is and I'm going to use the red marker to show you the old way when it was just quantity of funds remember we had demand going to the right you see how the interest rate went up well now that it's private funds down here I'm going to add the private back in there. It's the supply shift to the left. Both show the real interest rate rising and therefore would have the same impact on investment and aggregate demand that you were thinking of earlier. Okay. The only difference is, once again, is how they label this. Um, on the AP exam, for the free response questions, you can choose to usually to draw it the way you want to draw it most of the time. So I would just recommend saying quantity of funds. And so if the government's demanding some, just show demand. Maybe on a multiple choice question, they insert a graph and it says quantity of private funds and you're going to look for a choice. Just make sure you understand when they talk about private funds, it just means there's less available for the private sector. Therefore, there's less supply of loanable funds available for, for the private sector to borrow. Okay, um, so hopefully this did a decent job of explaining supply of loanable funds, demand of loanable funds, and then going into crowding out.